65 men stand shoulder to shoulder on a single Viking longship as it cuts across the North Sea. The wind is sharp and merciless, rolling in at 30 miles an hour. Cold spray bursts over the rail, soaking wool cloaks that never fully dry. The water below is only a few degrees above freezing, and each crashing wave smells of salt, tar, and the endless dark. Around them hangs the heavy scent of wet wool, smoked fish, sweat and the sharp bite of pine tar seeping from the ship's wooden seams. The deck is narrow, every movement touches another body, and every breath mixes with the breath of dozens of men living in a space no wider than a modern hallway. There are no walls, no privacy, no warm shelter, and more importantly, no toilets, not even a bucket set aside for waste. For weeks these men eat together, sleep together, and live in conditions so harsh that any modern crew would be overwhelmed by sickness within days. In every era of seafaring, conditions like these have meant one thing, disease. Filth spreads quickly, contaminated water cripples entire crews, cold, wet, and exhaustion break immune systems. Many navies across history, far better equipped than the Vikings, saw sailors die faster from illness than from battle. Yet this crew does not collapse. Somehow, they avoid the fate that should have been inevitable. This ship should have been a floating graveyard, but instead it became the vessel that carried Norse explorers across thousands of miles of brutal ocean. How did they survive the stench, the sickness, and the sea itself, while trapped on a ship built for speed, not comfort? Today we step into one of the strangest survival stories in human history, a mystery hidden in plain sight on the open deck of the Viking longship. When we look beyond the drama of crashing waves and freezing winds, the real danger on a Viking longship was not the sea itself, but the simple mathematics of human biology. The longship was never meant to protect its crew. It was built for speed, for raiding, and for crossing vast stretches of ocean in the shortest time possible. It was long and narrow, with no lower deck and no closed compartments. That meant every man lived, breathed, and moved in a space barely wide enough for two people to lie side by side. The crew rowed in shifts, gripping the same wet oars. They handled the same ropes, passed food hand to hand, and slept packed so tightly that body heat became their only real source of warmth. In conditions like this, illness should spread like fire. Cold air weakens the lungs. Constant dampness breaks down the body's defenses. Cuts and scrapes, impossible to keep dry, easily turn into infected wounds. And when every breath is shared with dozens of exhausted men, even the smallest sickness can take hold. Historical records from far later, more advanced naval eras make this truth painfully clear. Ships with surgeons, dedicated toilets, and strict hygiene rules still saw outbreaks of cholera, dysentery, and typhoid that killed more sailors than enemy weapons ever did. A British warship in the 19th century could lose an entire deck of men within weeks simply because one barrel of water turned foul. But here, on the Viking longship, the danger is multiplied. These men have no clean water storage, no medical knowledge, no quarantine areas, and no place to escape the cold. Every surface on the ship is touched by everyone. Every tool is shared. Every cough echoes into the faces of the men trying to keep the vessel moving. By all logic, a longship should have been the perfect incubator for disease. The environment, the closeness, the exhaustion, the moisture, everything works against survival. And yet, somehow, the Norse crews did not fall victim to the biological trap they lived inside. Their voyages were long, their population density extreme, and their risks enormous. Still, wave after wave of Norse expeditions succeeded. This contradiction forces us to look deeper, beyond assumptions, toward the hidden systems that kept these crews alive. Systems not built into the ship, but into the way the Vikings designed their world. To understand why disease did not sweep through Viking crews, we must turn to the archaeological record, because the truth lies not in what the Vikings added to their ships, but in what they very deliberately left out. Over the past century, some of the most remarkable ship discoveries have come from the cold soil of Scandinavia. In 1904, 
farmers digging through blue clay uncovered the Oseberg ship, one of the best-preserved Viking vessels ever found. Inside its hull, archaeologists catalogued everything with meticulous care. Carved wooden posts, shaped like snarling creatures. Fragments of woven textiles still showing faded dyes. Kitchen tools, vessels, and even a wooden bucket held together with iron bands. They found objects of daily life, objects of ceremony, objects of travel. But among hundreds of items, one thing was entirely missing. Any trace of a sanitation system. No chamber pots. No designated area for relieving oneself. No evidence of a fire-safe hearth or bronze brazier that could warm water or burn waste. It was as if the Vikings refused to create any enclosed space where filth could accumulate. At first, researchers believed Osberg might have been ceremonial, a burial ship never meant for true seafaring. But that theory collapsed in 1880 with the excavation of the Gokstad ship, a warship that had clearly travelled long distances. It carried water barrels, tools, spare oars, and cargo equipment. Its planks were worn smooth from years of use. And yet, just like Arseberg, it had no built-in sanitation of any kind. Modern technology confirmed this pattern again in 2020, when radar scans of the Gjellestad ship revealed no hidden compartments and no infrastructure for waste. Across two centuries of discoveries, the message is unmistakable. Norse shipbuilders intentionally designed their vessels without any permanent toilet or waste facility. This was not ignorance, it was engineering. By refusing to seal their ships, they eliminated the closed, stagnant spaces where disease thrives. They created vessels that were fast, flexible, and, in their own rugged way, biologically safer. The solution to their survival was not addition, it was subtraction. The key to understanding Viking survival lies in the most overlooked feature of the longship itself. If you stand on its deck, the ocean sits only half a meter below the rail. You can reach out and touch it. This design, called low freeboard, seems dangerous to modern eyes. It exposes the crew to waves, wind, and freezing spray. But for the Vikings, this closeness to the sea was the foundation of their sanitation strategy. Waste never stayed on the ship. Human waste, leftover food, anything that could rot or fester went straight over the side. There was no container, no pit, no bucket filled and forgotten beneath the deck because there was no deck at all. The ocean received everything instantly. Salt water diluted the bacteria, currents scattered it, and the ship moved on. In calm seas, this system worked flawlessly. In storms, when standing near the rail was too dangerous, the men used simple wooden buckets, the same kind found in their homes on land. But the rule never changed. The bucket was only temporary. Nothing stayed aboard long enough to decay. Even the ship's tendency to leak, something that modern sailors would consider a defect, became part of this natural cleaning cycle. A long ship built from overlapping planks, sealed with tar and animal fibers, will always take on water. Experimental reconstructions show that a 30-meter vessel might pull in 80 to 120 liters of seawater every hour. Viking crews constantly bailed out this water with wooden scoops, throwing it back into the sea. What they did not realize was that this steady flow of water acted like a living filtration system. Any crumbs of food, any spilled broth, any organic debris was swept into the bilge, mixed with cold salt water and flushed out before it could rot. There were no stagnant pools, no hidden pockets of decay like those that plagued later European ships with sealed cargo holds. The ocean moved through the long ship the way wind moves through an open room, carrying away every potential contaminant. But the Vikings did not rely on the sea alone. Their ship was designed to touch land as often as possible. A long ship shallow draft, only about one meter, meant it could go where other vessels could not. It could cross rivers, slide through coastal shallows, and ride directly onto sandy banks. Instead of depending on deep harbors, the crew could wait for the right tide and steer hard toward the shore. Within seconds, the bow rose onto the beach. This meant that no matter where they traveled Norway, Iceland, Greenland, or the coast of North America land, 
was never far away, and land was the reset button for their entire biological system. The moment the crew stepped onto solid ground, the rules of survival changed. Waste could be buried or absorbed naturally by soil. Fire became possible again, allowing the crew to cook proper meals, dry their cloaks, and warm their bodies. Streams provided cold, clean water for washing. Sand scrubbed away grime and parasites. Clothes soaked in seawater could be rinsed, wrung out and hung across lines to dry in the sharp northern wind. What had accumulated on the ship, smell, sweat, dirt, exhaustion, was shed on land like a second skin. Archaeological sites across the Viking world reveal just how regular and intentional these landings were. More than 200 natural harbour points mark their routes. Many were nothing more than sheltered coves or flat beaches. But some, like the vast winter base at Torxey in England, grew into temporary cities. There, post holes mark the footprints of dozens of structures. Hearth pits show repeated fires. Tools, bones and fragments of clothing prove families lived there through the cold months. These were not brief stops. They were seasonal settlements built around the idea that a ship could not sustain life alone. The land carried part of the burden. By dividing their time between open sea and frequent shore resets, Viking crews prevented the slow build-up of danger that doomed so many sailors in later centuries. Their longship was never a closed world. It was always part of a larger environment washed by the sea, renewed by the land and sustained by movement between the two. This rhythm more than any single invention, kept them alive where logic says they should have perished. Even with the advantages of the open sea and frequent resets on land, the Vikings still faced one of the greatest threats to any crew living in tight quarters, parasites and infection carried on the body itself. And here, culture became their most powerful line of defense. Across Scandinavia, archaeologists have uncovered graves containing combs carved from bone and antler some decorated, some plain, but all worn smooth from constant use. These were not luxury items. They were survival tools. Daily combing removed adult lice before the insects could lay eggs. Because lice eggs hatch within seven to ten days, this habit quietly broke the parasite's life cycle long before science explained why it worked. Foreign observers noticed this discipline. Ahmad ibn Fadlan watched Viking men wash their faces every morning, even though the practice of sharing the same washbowl seems unhygienic by modern standards. English chroniclers complained that the Norse bathed every Saturday, so reliably that the day itself became known as Washing Day. Many cultures of the medieval world saw bathing as rare or unnecessary, but the Vikings treated cleanliness as a weekly ritual, even in winter, when heating water cost precious firewood. They scrubbed with cold sea water, rubbed their skin with sand, and changed into dry garments whenever possible. In Norse society, appearing dirty was more than unpleasant. It was dishonorable. Reputation carried such weight that no warrior wanted to be known as the man who smelled foul or looked unkempt. This shame-based social pressure created a distributed network of hygiene, where every individual was responsible not only for themselves but for the health of the entire crew. Their habits produced real biological protection. Clean hair and skin reduced the presence of lice, fleas and mites, which were major carriers of typhus and other deadly diseases across medieval Europe. Strong winds on deck dried damp clothing quickly, slowing bacterial growth. Sand acted as a natural exfoliant, removing grime and parasites from the skin. And because the longship was open to the sky, there was no trapped humid air where respiratory diseases could concentrate. Without knowing the science, the Vikings practiced a form of disease control, rooted in discipline rather than medicine. But perhaps the most brilliant part of their survival system came from something that looked completely ordinary, what they drank. Fresh water does not stay safe inside wooden barrels for long. Bacteria thrive in the dark, damp interior. Many later navies suffered catastrophic outbreaks when their water barrels turned foul. The Vikings avoided this danger, not through scientific knowledge, but through necessity. Fresh water was heavy and spoiled quickly, so they relied on weak beer and sour milk, which lasted far longer on long voyages. 
what they did not realize is that both were microbiological shields. Weak beer required boiling during the brewing process, killing nearly all harmful bacteria before the liquid ever touched a barrel. With alcohol levels around 2%, it did not dehydrate the crew, but it prevented the explosive growth of microbes that killed so many sailors in later centuries. Sour milk and fermented dairy drinks like Skyer and Sermiolk had low acidity, which inhibited the growth of pathogens. These foods were thick with beneficial bacteria that supported digestion and made the gut more resilient to contamination. In a time when water itself could be deadly, the Vikings drank liquids that were, by accident, naturally safe. Meanwhile, the longship's constant leakage kept the bilge clean. As seawater flowed in and out, it washed away organic debris before rot could take hold. Together, all these factors formed a layered defense. Clean bodies, fermented drinks, an open deck, and a ship that never trapped filth. The Vikings did not engineer a sanitation system. They lived one. When we step back and look at the Viking longship as a whole, a subtle truth begins to emerge. The Norse were never spared from hardship. They lived with chronic infections, dental pain, and the constant threat of injury. They were not immune to sickness, but what makes their story extraordinary is that, unlike so many naval crews of later centuries, they rarely collapsed under the weight of sudden, catastrophic disease. Their voyages continued, their raids succeeded, and their settlements grew across some of the harshest landscapes on earth. They survived not because they conquered nature, but because they understood their limits and built their world around them. Instead of sealing their ships to shut out the sea, they opened them to the wind. Instead of storing water that could turn deadly, they drank liquids that nature kept safe. Instead of adding systems to manage waste, they refused to let waste accumulate in the first place. Their solutions were simple, but profoundly effective. Nothing depended on delicate technology. Nothing relied on a single specialist. Their survival came from habits, movement, discipline, and an intimate relationship with the world around them. This is the deeper lesson hidden in the longship's salt-soaked timbers. A system without fragile parts does not break under pressure. It bends, it shifts, and it continues forward. Five centuries before Columbus crossed the Atlantic, Norse sailors stood on the shores of North America, alive and capable, because they had mastered a truth many societies still struggle to embrace. The best way to defeat disease is not always to fight it directly, but to build a life where disease has no place to take hold. Their long ships carried warriors, traders, and explorers, but above all, they carried a quiet genius, a way of surviving that turned the sea itself into their greatest ally.